Revealing Jesus, Relationships for Life. Hello friends, I'm Jill Morricone and welcome to another edition of Sabbath School Panel. We're on the fourth quarter, the first lesson. Our topic and theme for this quarter is education. I want to encourage you to grab your quarterly and follow along with us for this study, Education in the Garden of Eden. If you don't have a quarterly, you can always go to the following website, absg.adventist.org. That stands for Adult Bible Study Guide. So grab a friend, grab your Bible and notepad, and get ready as we explore God's Word together. Hello and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. Last quarter we had an incredible study written by Pastor Mark Finley, Making Friends for God, and I hope that you journeyed with us through that third quarter. This quarter we begin an uh, entire quarter on education. Mm -hmm. I am excited about it. I was actually trained as a teacher. And so this quarter has a special place in my heart, you could say. Education is so vitally important, whether we're young and really in school, or 50 or 100, we still are being educated in that school of Christ. Mm -hmm. I want to introduce our panel to you at this time. To my left, Pastor Ryan Day, it's a privilege and joy to have you here. Amen. It's a blessing to be here as always. I'm excited. Mm. So. Amen. You always bring great enthusiasm and fire to the study. Always. Speaking of fire, Pastor Kenny That's Shelton, right. we know <laughs> he's going to bring that too through the power of the Holy Spirit. Glad Amen. to have you here. It's always good to study the Word of God together. Look forward to this, uh, this uh, quarter. Amen. Yeah. And there is a face next on the well, Sabbath School panel, well. which we have not had on the panel for two quarters. We are delighted that our sister Shelly Quinn back from surgery and mm. here on the panel. So glad you're here. Woohoo! Yeah, I can't yeah, tell you how excited I am to be back, really. Amen. 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 And a new face we're delighted to have here on the Sabbath School panel, Pastor Ronnie Shelton, mm -hmm. and he has been on previous Sabbath School panels, and so glad to have you here. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Mm -hmm. Amen. Before we go any further to our study here on education in the Garden of Eden, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Ryan, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Our Father in heaven, Lord, uh, we dare not move any further without seeking your guidance, Lord. Mm -hmm. um, this subject of education, Lord, is so important, mm -hmm. so, so important, Lord. And we know that we need the power of your Holy Spirit Amen. right now to give us wisdom, to give us knowledge, uh, to lead and guide us through this study that as we rightly divide your word of truth by your leadership, Lord, yes. may the words come alive, may the message come alive, and may Amen. each and every person at home and around the world, wherever they are watching, be blessed. We praise you and we thank you for being our wonderful God of love. Mm -hmm. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Our opening scripture is Proverbs 9, verse 10. You want to open up your Bibles there to Proverbs 9, verse 10. Last quarter, of course, was written by Pastor Mark Finley. This quarter was written by, it's a compilation. Mm. It's written by Seventh-day Adventist college professors throughout the North American division. So you could say the great gifted minds got mm. together and put together this lesson. Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom mm. and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. All true knowledge, all understanding, by extension, all education begins with God. It begins with the knowledge of God. Mm. It begins with the knowledge of His Word. It begins with the understanding provided by the Holy Spirit. That's why we always mm. pray before we open up Amen. the Word of God. Mm. You could say all education begins with God Himself. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand God, how do you understand life or science or language or Man. art? Mm. All true education begins with the knowledge of the character of God. Amen. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 tells us that God is love. Mm -hmm. God's character is love. In fact, in the book Education, this is a little book compilation written mm -hmm. by Ellen White. 
page 16, it says, love the basis of creation and of redemption is the basis of true education. Amen. All true education begins with God, a knowledge of the character of God. And of course that character is love. All true education focuses on the restoration of the character of God in mm. humankind. That's right. That's mm. the goal and purpose of education. Christ came to show us the Father and to restore us back to the image of the divine. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I love this mm. scripture. If anyone is in Christ, mm -hmm. he or she is a new creation. Yeah. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things right. have mm. become new. All true Christian education focuses on doctrine and worship, instruction, fellowship, evangelism, and service. Mm -hmm. By contrast, education to become rich or famous, education to become skeptical or cynical, mm. education to become knowledgeable just for the sake of knowledge. Without a true knowledge of God, it means nothing. Amen. Jesus said in Mark 8, verse 36, what shall it profit mm. if a man gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Mm -hmm. Literature, science, medicine, art, economics, all of that is important, but without an understanding of God, without the restoration of the character of God in our soul, it profits us nothing. Mm. So we look at education from the standpoint of the Garden of Eden. That is our lesson for today. The first school, as it were, mm -hmm. Adam and Eve being the first students mm. in the Garden of Eden. So let's turn all the way back to Genesis and we're gonna take a look at that. Genesis, I pick it up in Genesis 2. But before we do that, we better read our memory text. Mm -hmm. That is Job 36, verse 22. And if you have your lesson, you can just follow along with mm -hmm. us there. Job 36, 22. Behold, God is exalted by his power. Mm -hmm. Who teaches like him? Mm -hmm. That tells Great. us yeah. God is the ultimate teacher. That's right. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, he is yeah. the ultimate teacher. Who teaches like him? Yeah. And as we go through this quarter, we will discover that Jesus was a master teacher when he walked this earth. What an incredible teacher he was. On Sunday, we look at the first school. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to read and I love stories. And mm -hmm. you think when you read stories, there's always what? A cast and characters and you kind of develop them as you go through the story. There's always a setting and a background. There's a plot line or a storyline. But in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter two, this is not just a story. Well. This really happened. And what happened in Genesis two and three, as we will study today, it changed history yeah. forever. That's right. Who are the characters in the story? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all present in creation, all involved as teachers, you could say, in this first school. Adam and Eve being the first pupils, the first students. You know, if the teacher made you, would you think he understood you? That's just a mind boggling concept to me. You know, right. as, as educators were taught, understand your students, know your students, mm -hmm. know their strengths and weaknesses and right. how best to help them. Who better understands mm, us right. than right. the Lord Jesus Christ? That's right. that's right. The setting for the first school was the Garden of wow. Eden. Mm -hmm. There's an article I read. This is from um, UC Berkeley. They did a study discussing the work of Dr. Ming Kuo. And they studied how it helps and benefits students to be educated outside. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. God knew this in the beginning because Adam and Eve were in the garden. They were outside in their education, their entire education. Now in this study, they did not do the entire education outside. They did one class. They took them out for a 30 minute period. They just sat in the grass. They did nothing special. They did their regular schoolwork. Well, they didn't even do anything pertaining to outside. They just sat outside. They found when they came indoors, their focus level and their engagement continued mm -hmm. exponentially through even the entire next class period. What a gift yes. Amen. Adam and Eve had to right. be able to yeah. study outside. Yeah. So I wanna look, you know, I have a list, <laughs> seven principles right of true education mm -hmm. that we find from Genesis 2 seven principles that we find in this first school. 
Right. Principle number one, mm -hmm. true education centers on Christ. Mm -hmm. Look at Genesis 2, verse 8. We're going to actually get our first principles from the same verse. Mm -hmm. Genesis 2, verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. The word I want to focus on is garden. In Hebrew, it means to be enclosed, fenced off, protected. Mm -hmm. It's a form of temple garden, which was later represented by the tabernacle where man met with God. Wow. Both the tabernacle that later happened with the children of Israel where God would come down with a cloud and meet with them and the garden of Eden in the beginning served as the meeting place, you could say, mm -hmm. between God and humanity. In fact, in Genesis 3, we won't go there, but remember after sin entered, God called to Adam, where are you? Mm -hmm. Because he was coming for his regular meeting time with his students. Mm -hmm. That would have been Adam and Eve. True education centers on Christ. Adam and Eve, as the first students, had access to their teacher, to God, to Jesus every day. Mm -hmm. Principle number two, true education has boundaries mm -hmm. and organization. Mm -hmm. The same scripture, we already read it, the Lord God planted the garden in Eden. And if you think about that word garden, not only is it this tabernacle meeting place with God, but if it means to be enclosed, fenced off and protected, that shows that there's order. Mm -hmm. That shows that there are boundaries. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes in education we say we just focus on Jesus and that's it. Jesus is incredible and we want to focus on him. Yeah. But we need some measure of organization mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. educational structure. Yeah. Principle number three, true education is enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Learning mm -hmm. should right. be enjoyable. The same verse, the Lord God planted that garden eastward in Eden. The word Eden denotes pleasure and delight. Do educators today, now whether you're a teacher, whether you're a pastor, you are truly mm. educating in your congregation. Whether you are a parent, you educate your children every day. Whether you are in the workplace, you provide education for people around you. Your neighbors, you can educate neighbors no matter who they are. True education should center on Christ. It has boundaries and organization. It should be enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Number four, true education involves the teacher's knowledge and care for the student. Mm -hmm. The same scripture, Genesis 2, 8, at the end, it says, he put the man whom he had formed. God formed Adam. Clearly, he understood him. Principle number five, true education involves teaching right and wrong. Uh -huh. Verse nine, next verse, out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Jump down to verse 16. Mm. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, mm. for in the day you eat of it you will surely yeah. die. Uh -huh. In today's culture this is considered extreme to teach moral absolutes, to yes. teach that there is a right and wrong, but that is biblical. Yeah. True yeah. education right. involves teaching right from wrong. Yeah, that's right. Number six, true education involves work, not just book learning, but practical education. Mm -hmm. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. Now we think work was a consequence of sin. It was not. God gave Adam and Eve practical employment mm -hmm. work before sin ever mm -hmm. entered the earth. Right. Finally, number seven, true education is not solitary. Mm -hmm. Learning involves companionship. Mm -hmm. We learn in groups together. Now this verse, the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now that refers to marriage, but also in education, we can learn mm -hmm. together. Mm. Right. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Jill. You're always very <laughs> thorough and I like that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, you know, my, my lesson is Monday's lesson and it's got an interesting title, Intrusion. Well. Intrusion, which automatically kind of sets a negative connotation in your mind. What, what type of intrusion? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have to go very far in the book of Genesis before the mood changes. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see that Adam and Eve is placed into the Garden of Eden. 
And Eden simply means pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I love that because we see that God is not against pleasure. He wants to give us pleasure. He loves us so much that He wants us to be happy. And He he wanted to put Adam and Eve in a beautiful, perfect atmosphere of love. And just it's just an amazing thought to know that God set them up for perfection. I mean, they were in a perfect atmosphere. Uh, We see that God wanted them to have a pleasurable educational experience, learning from, as Jill brought out, nature as well as the Creator Himself. What a blessing to think that we can, uh, you know, that we we will one day have an opportunity to learn from Jesus in person, right? Right. These, this brother and sister had the opportunity to walk and talk with God in His very presence. And so I could just imagine how how awesome that was. Uh, But of course, we know it wasn't long before uh, this educational experience was interrupted. And so uh, you, you look at kind of the layout of Genesis and you kind of would expect that there would be a few chapters before this great antagonistic figure would approach. But I mean, you, you haven't even had time to open the screen door, open the front door, come into the foyer or the, the entrance area of the home and kick off your shoes before... Yeah. Here's the enemy already. In fact, there's a great shift that takes place as we transition from Genesis chapter 2 to chapter 3. It's interesting to note that when you're in Genesis 1 and 2, you have language such as, you know, words like good and very good and not ashamed and pleasant. I mean, you just get get this kind of overall feeling of everything's just fine and dandy, right? But when you, by the time you get to Genesis chapter 3 in the very first verse, it opens with the serpent being described as more Mm. subtle or cunning than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Uh, So definitely a shift in mood from positive to negative. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and we're going to notice something as we get into these first few verses. I'm not necessarily going to give a uh, kind of a commentary breakdown, but I want to look at something that's kind of implied and very much clear in these texts if you just read into and look into what is actually there. So notice Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, very interesting. God's not wasting any time. Mm -hmm. He says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And I just want to pause there. God is somewhat giving the reader, and in this case it's us, anyone who's studied his word, he was informing Moses as Moses is writing this down and recording it. Let me give you a little bit of an understanding into the character and the very nature of this enemy. Mm. Okay, notice how he didn't say he's all powerful or he's just so strong or he's just so awesome Mm -hmm. in his, you know, in his power. No, 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 no. He's described as cunning. Mm -hmm. He's subtle. Well, what does that mean? What what is his strength? Mm -hmm. He's deceptive. He's crafty. You know, he's he's he he's 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 very cunning in nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, His strength is thought. Uh, uh, thought interruption. His strength is is altering and changing uh, or, or, or causing you to alter your thoughts, which we're about to see here. Uh. It's exactly what is about to take place in Genesis chapter 3. So that he's more subtle than any beast mm-hmm. of the field. So up to this point, Adam and Eve have had a wonderful opportunity to walk and talk with God, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they are learning from him and about him, which was wonderful. Uh, however, the image, notice this, the image of the character of God is about to be put on the stands Uh-oh. And, the, and challenged by the serpent. What have they known about God up to this point? Love. God is just loving. He's yes. kind. He's merciful. He's just this mm. awesome, all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God. And they're so great to be in His presence. But Satan is about to plant a seed into Eve's mind to see God in a different light. Mm. And you say, what do you say here? Let's look at this right here. So here comes accusation number one against the character of God. Mm. Uh, the devil plants the seed in Eve's mind mm. that God is not who he says he is. Mm-hmm. So notice Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. This is a continuance of what we just read. It says, and he said to the woman... Has God indeed said, you shall need of, not eat of every tree of the garden? Uh-oh. Now, many people would, would just read right over this, but notice here, he's, he, there's an implied accusation against the character of God here. Yeah. Did, did God tell you that? Really? Did God tell you? that? Look at all these wonderful, beautiful trees in the garden. And there's one in this garden that he said you can't eat of. How unfair is that? In other words, accusation number one. In fact, there's three accusations against the character of God in these opening verses. And I want you to see the drastic transition from Genesis 1 and 2 to what we see in in chapter 3 here. Mm -hmm. What he's saying here is, you know, God is unclear. 
Hmm. Isn't he unreasonable and restrictive? Is this the kind of God you want to serve? Someone who just won't give you everything that you want, right? Hmm. How dare he tell you, look at this fruit. You can just imagine it. Look at this fruit, Eve. Man, doesn't it look so good? And God's keeping this from you. Mercy. He's restrictive. Is that the kind of God you want to serve? All right. But notice it continues on. The woman clarifies in verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest mm. ye die. Mercy. Okay, so notice yeah. this. Yeah. Notice how Eve uh, did not emphasize the warning the same way that God yeah. did in Genesis 2.17. Right. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so the fact that she is entertaining a conversation with this serpent, he's already penetrated her oh, thoughts. Yes, yes. He's already got her confused. He, you know, God had said that you shall surely die. Mm. And now notice what she says, you know, in, in the day that we did it, you know, we shall die. Mm. Um, but, you know, she, and she even adds a word. We can't, we can't even touch it, even though God didn't say that. Mm. She's confused because she's entertaining this idea, uh, this thought, this conversation with the devil. And so notice mm. verse four, the serpent responds and he says to the woman, you will not surely die. Now notice he added the word surely. Mm. In Genesis 2, 17, God did say, you shall surely die. He says, oh, no, 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 no. Mm. Don't believe that. You're not really going to die. Yeah. And so here's accusation number two. Mm. What is he saying to her? God's a liar. Mm. Yeah. You can't trust him. He's untrustworthy mm -hmm. and he's dishonest. So by, the, by this, by now I could imagine Eve is, she's full fledged, like launched into this state of confusion. Wait a second. Yeah. Cause she's never heard a lie before. Right. She's never heard it. I mean, she's been in a perfect state of, of, of just perfection wow. and love and mm. truth and honesty. And now she's hearing all this for the first time. Wow. And then comes the big blow. Uh oh. Accusation number three, verse five. Notice what it says here. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, we know there's someone in Scripture that said he wanted to be like God. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the devil sharing his own heart, Necess not necessarily the truth, obviously. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that, yes, her eyes were going to be open. Yeah. Their eyes were going to be open to see things that they had never seen before. Mm -hmm. But notice accusation number three, the fact that he's saying, oh, you know what? God just, he knows that you're going to be like him mm -hmm. and you're going to know good from mm -hmm. evil. You're going to be educated. <laughs> You're going to be informed in such a way good. that you've never known. God's withholding information. Uh -huh. He's withholding a good education from you. He's, he's keeping all of this other stuff from you. In other words, God is selfish. He's only looking out for himself. You are better off without God. That's what we're seeing right here. The enemy has Eve so confused that she now sees God in a completely different way. This leads her to distrust his word and be overcome by temptation. You know the story. Wow. There's an intrusion. Mm -hmm. So I heard someone once say, sin is the result, get this, sin is the result of a misrepresentation of God's character. Mm -hmm. yeah. Man, yeah. that's right. So why did Eve sin? Well, obviously she conceived that, through, she, she fell to that temptation, mm -hmm. but ultimately she fell to the temptation because now she sees God in a completely different way than what she did before. She has been deceived into believing that God is not who he says it is. And my friends, I, I have just a little over a minute here to make this point very clear. Many of us have this same, we're, we're entertaining thoughts and ideas of the enemy. We're entertaining too much conversation That's right. and too much time with the enemy that he has our thoughts confused. Mm -hmm. Many of us are, are, are ifing and ifing and what ifing and questioning and butting God's word all too much to the point that we're questioning God's word so much that now we distrust God himself. Wow. And when we come to the point to where we see God in a way that he is not because we've entertained too much conversation and too much time with the enemy, right. then it's going to lead us to live a life of sin because sin is the result of a misrepresentation of God's character. Yeah. When you see yeah. God for who he is, who he truly is, mm -hmm. then you will see a God of love. You will yeah. see a God that's not withholding anything. He wants you to be fully educated to the yeah. utmost. Mm -hmm. right. In fact, that uh, you know, you say, well, why, but why does the devil keep fighting, right? You know, he's still, well, because <laughs> Revelation 20 or Revelation 12 verse 12 clearly tells us that he knows he has but a short time, okay? He may keep fighting in this battle, but Jesus has won the war. Bring yeah. yourself and put yourself on the side of Jesus. Become educated mm. by the master of the universe right. and leave that devil alone. Amen. Amen. Praise the Woo. Lord. Mercy. Thank you, Ryan. We're going to take yeah. a short break. We'll be right back. Amen. 
ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study as we continue education in the Garden of Eden. We pick it up with Tuesday's lesson, Pastor Kenny. Oh, this is, I tell you, the, the foundation which was laid is beautiful. So really I'm going to play off of that in Genesis, uh -huh. what both of you have laid there and maybe just put it down kind of in some things you might take some notes on and, 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 and refer back to later. But I, would, I want to refer first of all to one text in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. I'm going to read that. Again, there's a, there's a purpose in reading this is because then we're going to play off of that and see where the confusion, because we're looking at Tuesday's lesson, missing the message. Mm. You know, how can we miss the message? How did Eve miss this message that God gave so clearly? Right. <laughs> and is it possible that maybe we are missing mm. a message for today? Mm. The Bible says in Genesis 2, 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I know you've read that many, many, many times. But still, when I read it, it seems clear. Right. Of course, I've read a lot of things in Scripture that seem really clear, and I found out I've done the opposite sometimes. So we have to come back. So let's look at that. I'm going to, about 11, 11 things that I find here where Eve missed the mark. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at, number one, we're going to miss, as we read the passage of Scripture there, God's command, number one, was clear. I think you brought that out. God's command, number one, is very clear. We just read how clear that it, it is. Right. And then when, notice when she was questioned by the serpent, number two, Eve watered down what she had been taught mm. in the garden. Mm. We have to be very careful. We've been taught or the Holy Spirit has taught us certain truths. And when we're put under pressure, what do we do? We water, water it down. It down. <laughs> And that's a no-no with God. God doesn't want us to water it down. Look what happened here when she watered it down. She got herself in trouble and got the whole world in trouble. Number three, she didn't take God's word seriously. I realize you brought all these things up because if she had realized how serious God was mm -hmm. and the implications of what would happen right, to the world and all that followed after, maybe she would have made a different, you know, different decision. So she didn't take God's word seriously. Number four, she began to repeat the message, notice, to the serpent, but I think you brought out, not exactly. Mm, <laughs> See, right. sometimes we start repeating what we've heard, but not exactly because right. we're afraid of stepping on somebody's toes or we don't want any repercussions. We don't want mm, any letters written. Um, <laughs> you, know, you, you know what I'm talking about here. So we begin to kind of water it just and soften it just a little bit here. Right. That's what she did, but it got her in trouble and it's going to get you in trouble and get me into trouble. Number five. The serpent was already, we know this, familiar with God's Word. Mm. Yes. Yep. We say, oh, don't give him any credit, but you know what? He knows the Word, right. and he knows it well That's right. because he, has, he, he knows what he's going to do with it. He knows if you know the Word, too. Number six, the serpent was well prepared. I don't think you used this word, Brother Ryan, but you talk, he twisted. That's right. He was ready as soon as the Word came out. He's ready to twist it. As soon as you get, get on, you know, get, I want to get this message out to the world. He's going to start twisting things around and try to twist it around your neck, as it were, or around <laughs> your tongue. Good. Yeah, or you yeah. got your foot in your mouth. So he tries to twist God's word. That's right. Number seven, the serpent, notice this. I thought it was interesting. I sensed in here that the serpent prayed on Eve's innocence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's think about it. Mm -hmm. He prayed on, you mentioned, all she knew was good. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, loving, kind. And so he knew she was innocent. And just as the enemy tries to prey on our or our children, he starts at a very early age mm -hmm. when they're somewhat, as it were, innocent. Right. He begins to twist things in their ears and in their minds. So we need to be careful that we don't add or we don't subtract yes. from the Word of God. Revelation 22, what, 18 and 19 sure. tells us there. I mean, don't, our, our name will be removed, so we need to make sure. But listen, I'm going to say something quickly. Don't let that stop you from giving the message that God has given you. That's right. Amen. Amen. I've heard many people say, I'm afraid that I might get it wrong, and so I'll influence somebody else's life, and they may be lost to the cause. Be praying, studying, know what you know, this truth of God's Word. 
give that truth. Amen. Right. Give that truth. And if you happen, I'll be careful. Ooh, if you happen to make a mistake, right? If you happen to, all you do, you go back to them and you say, you know what? I, I, I missed that point right there and I want to make it right. But give the word of God. Number eight, serpent said part of the message was incorrect. We know that. He said part of it. He didn't say all of it. Basically, right. insinuation was part of it was incorrect. And number nine, upon hearing this, Eve could have, when he said, well, this is not quite correct. Well, you look at Eve could have said, well, just a moment. I'm going to go and I'm going to ask God. I'm going to ask the master teacher. Right. I'm going to go back to the classroom right. and I'm going to ask God and he will tell me whether it is or whether she didn't do that. Mm -hmm. See, this was part of her education. She did not follow through with it. She accepted the serpent's message, number 10. Mm -hmm. Instead of God's message, hoodwink, right. deceived, she accepted the serpent's message. Now, in order to accept the devil's message, we have to, number one, doubt. So what did he do? He began to plant doubt in her mind, you know, on her part about God and what he had said. You hear that a lot, don't you, when somebody's reading it? Well, I, I, I know what it says, but, well, it seems like it now. It's different now. And so as soon as the enemy hears that or he plants that in your mind, doubt, he's got you. Mm -hmm. We never should doubt Scripture. We should say, well, I don't understand it maybe right now. Oh, I want to read more and I want to understand it, but I'm not going to doubt what God has said. So our lesson wants us to examine a little farther what uh, Brother Ryan uh, read there in Genesis chapter 3, 4 through 6 in the few moments that we've got left here. And, and, and I can't say it will be any clearer, but we pray that it will be an addition. It will kind of be added on some things. We must, right. we must be very careful that we are not, use the word I think, deceived. Even if we think we have some good training, even if we think Amen. we have a good education, even if we think that we are founded on the rock, you know, of Jesus Christ, we right. still must be very careful because again, Adam and Eve, you couldn't get any better teacher. You Amen. just couldn't do it. You didn't have to worry about it. Sometimes when you go to class and different things now, you have to, re are they telling the truth? You know, it's what they're teaching the truth. Mm -hmm. he, they didn't have to do that. And so it, as we look at it here, we must remember that Adam and Eve, again, had the very best education in the garden that was brought out here. Genesis 3, 4 through 6, verse 4 said, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not, what? You read it. Die. Ye shall not surely die. So what, what does this do? Right. Simply, Matthew 21, 21, it makes, you know, it's, it's a good statement here. It says, Jesus speaking to the fruitless fig tree. What does he do? He plants what? Doubt. Right. Mm. First thing he does, the devil goes, doubt, doubt, and pretty soon we get turned. Jesus speaking of the fruitless fig tree, he said, if you have faith and doubt, I like it, doubt not. Ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also, then he speaks about the mountain. You can speak to it and, and it's right. be cast into to the sea. Satan's first question was to arouse doubt. That's and right. he's going to do it to you and he's going to do it to me. Arouse, you know, I receive letters sometimes and people, they, they challenge you on what has been said or what you're teaching or the Advent movement. You have to look back and say, has God taught this? Is it in his word? You have to be sure and you have to be Amen. strong in that and stay with it because you don't know who you're dealing with and people write letters and where they're at in their Christian walk or who they are. So stay with the word of God. So the first question, he did erase doubt. Now with this done, what did he do? Once he got Eve to doubt, automatically that put him in the position of authority. He's in charge now mm -hmm. see, because he already got her to, to, to doubt. And, but he got her to doubt the clear, simple command that God said, ye shall not surely die. Mm -hmm. Literally, that reads in Scripture, ye will positively not die. Mm. You know, then it, no right. doubt about it. Positive, you're not going to die. And I'm sure he was persuasive when he said it. He already had her under his control. Right. Notice that. And of course, Satan is John 8, 44. What is he? He's a, he's a liar and the truth's not him. He's a father of lies. Mm -hmm. He's never going to tell the truth because he is a liar. Notice that. Mm -hmm. For God, notice this, verse 5. It says, notice, for, for God doth know that in this day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be, you mentioned it, what? Open. open. And eyes shall be open. <laughs> notice this. You don't have, don't, don't fear about dying because you're not going to die. Don't worry about that. You know, to fear, think about fear of God, you will become, notice this, don't fear God. Maybe God's afraid that you're going to be a rival. Maybe God's fearing here that maybe you're going to try to be an equal. Right. Maybe God's going to feel threatened, you see, if you do this thing, your competition. Then he noticed what he said. He said he, he charged God then with doing what? 
with lying. Mm -hmm. It's mentioned to charge God with lying. And you can go through all that. We don't have time to look through all that. I, I want to read something at the very end here in a few seconds that we have. I thought it was very, very, very interesting here. Um, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 56. Notice what it says. Adam understood that his companion had transgressed the command of God and disregarded the only prohibition laid upon him as a test of the fidelity and love. There was a terrible struggle in the mind. He mourned that he had permitted Eve to wander from his side, but now the deed was done. He must be separated from the, her whose society it was a real joy. You know, he had to make a choice, and we have to make a choice today. That's right. Amen and amen. Well, I have Wednesday's lesson, which is regaining what was lost. So here we have Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. They are in the garden, mm -hmm. in the classroom with, with God. They are learning about his character. They're learning about his love in mm -hmm. such an intimate way. Yes. Can you imagine having God come alongside of you Mercy. to teach? Mm -hmm. But they hear the distortion of the truth. They hear the twisting of God's word. And what do they do? She chooses mm. to accept that. And I want to submit to you, I think part of that was because Satan, the serpent, mm -hmm. appealed to her ego. Well, mm. yeah, sure. What? Yeah, You're going to let right. God tell you? I mean, he said you can eat of any tree in the garden, just not from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What mm. is God saying? It's not up to you to decide what's good for you. Mm -hmm. It's not up to you to Come decide on. what's bad for you. I'm your creator. Yes. I'm going to put you in these protective boundaries. So don't eat there. Mm -hmm. But Satan convinces her. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You can be like God. How many people nowadays are trying to decide, as you said, Jill, no absolute truth. Mm. You know, what's good for me? I decide. What's bad for me? I decide. They don't go to the Word of God. Mm. So what's happened now? They were banished from the garden. They are suffering the yeah. consequences of sin. And more than ever, remedial education mm. is required. Mm. You've heard of remedial English. That means it's a remedy. It's a cure. So the way education, much of Christian education, mm. It's pointing back to Jesus. Mm -hmm. It is to teach how he can restore. Because right. we see Eden lost. We see the fall of mankind. They fell under the influence of Satan. But now the God's whole purpose is to restore mm -hmm. his image in us. It is to restore mm -hmm. the Garden of Eden, right. which is what's going to yeah. happen at the very last. Mm -hmm. We're going to regain what was lost. Yeah. So let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Ah, I love this verse. This is one of my favorite passages. Education is more than gaining knowledge. Mm -hmm. Education is developing character. Yeah. And the good news is that God provides everything we need That's for right. salvation yes. and restoration. Yes. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. I'm going to read it briefly, then I'll go through and break it down. 2 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 4. As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness mm -hmm. through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, mm -hmm. by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, Mercy. having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Mm. Wow, that's a mouthful. Yes. Right. Let's go back and take it apart. Mm -hmm. Verse 2. Or verse 3, His divine power, His grace is sufficient. Mm -hmm. He is our sufficiency. Mm -hmm. It's not our yeah. power. It is His divine power has given a, to us well, how much? All, All things. things. Oh, every right. spiritual resource. Ephesians mm -hmm. 1.11 says that every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms is already yours in Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah. So he's given us all things that pertain to life. Right. That word is zoe mm -hmm. in the Greek. This is eternal life. We're not talking about just life on earth. Everything that pertains to eternal life and to godliness. 
Mm. What does that mean? Godliness. It means godly living, living in obedience mm. to God. We're loyal. We're expressing our love and loyalty mm. through obedience, through the knowledge of Him. Listen, this is an intimate knowledge mm. of Him. That's right. When, when you think, Jesus said in Je, uh, John 17, verse 3, that this is eternal life, that you may Know, know him, know him mm, and the one whom right. he sent. So it is through our intimate relationship with the Lord that we really get to know mm -hmm. him and can yeah. draw on his yes. power. He says, who, speaking of God, called us by glory and virtue, by which, by what? By his glory, his character mm -hmm. and his virtue, mm -hmm. his moral excellence yeah. yes. through his character, moral excellence have been giving to us exceedingly great and precious promises. And the covenant, the prince of the covenant, the mediator of our covenant is Jesus Christ. And 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, all of God's That's promises right. yes. are ours in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So he says, uh, so he, they've been giving to us the exceedingly great and precious promises that through these, through what? Mm -hmm. his through promises. His promises, promises, you may be partakers of His divine nature, His character, His moral excellence. We get to His righteousness that is imparted yeah. to us. Mm -hmm. We're born again. We're made anew. Hallelujah. Yeah. The Holy Spirit indwells us. That's right. And we have, you know, when Adam and Eve fell, I believe there was a spiritual DNA change. Mm -hmm. The DNA was the devil's nature acquired. Mm -hmm. yeah. But now we get to have partake of the new, this, his divine nature. Yeah. So it is God's uh, divine nature acquired, mm -hmm. DNA. Yes. Having escaped that's the corruption, mm -hmm. that's the, the decomposition of the world, that's through lust. So and when it says that we escaped, it means that we repent, we flee from it. Mm. But now let's quickly, if I've got time, go over the next verses, because once we accept, hey, all of these promises are ours, all of God's promises are yours, then there's some action that's required on our part. Well, yeah. that's right. He's giving us His divine nature. He's giving us all of His promises. But listen to this, verse 5. But also for this reason, because of all of His amazing grace, everything we've just looked at, mm. giving all diligence. You've got to dedicate yourself. Yeah. Mm. You've got to make a maximum effort to honor God. Mm. Add to your faith virtue. Well, What's virtue? Mm -hmm. Moral excellence. Yeah, yeah. To your virtue, oh. add knowledge. That's a diligent study of God's Word as mm -hmm. you try to comprehend and apply His truth. Mm -hmm. You know, the quarterly, I wanted to read this one little education yeah. uh, paragraph said, mm. true education will lead to true knowledge, mm. the knowledge of Christ. That's right. And thus not only will we become more like Him, but we may also stand and share our knowledge of mm. Him with yeah, others. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Then the scripture goes on, 2 Peter 1 verse 6 says, add to your knowledge self-control. Hey, mm. self-restraint, self-discipline. God does not control us. He is not in the controlling business. That's right. Yeah. He granted you free will. So, well, you know, it's actually wrong. I used to say, well, you know, let the Holy Spirit uh, surrender and let Him control. No, it is a moment by moment decision. Yeah. That's right. He's never in control. We always have to be submitting to Him. Amen. So there's that self discipline to self control, perseverance. That's patient endurance as we apply the promises of God's Word 
to perseverance, yeah. add godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, yeah. to brotherly kindness, love. Now yeah. listen what he says. <laughs> For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful. Mm -hmm. But he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Mm -hmm. Some people are suffering spiritual amnesia. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't remember Christ's sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, pursuing these spiritual guidelines. And in so doing, verse 11 says, an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly mm. into the everlasting King of our Lord and Sa Kingdom of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Right. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. As we continue in our uh, study of school and education, mm -hmm. uh, I've got Thursday's part, the despisers of authority. Okay. You know, that is so common oh, now, the despisers of authority. It yes. seems like it's everywhere we look. Right. Somebody despises the authority that is in charge. Mm -hmm. Now, as we talk about the Garden of Eden and, and school, uh, we know that it makes me think back to my school days. There was always some kids in the class who seemed like they just got it right off the bat. Yeah, you know, right. they made good grades. They didn't have to mm. take the books home. You know, I wasn't one of those, no. fortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> I, I was one who had to take books home and study. Mm -hmm. But we find that there are those who are blessed with that. As I said, I wasn't one of those. And as we get into our study today, we're going to find out, as Shelley was bringing out in 1 Peter chapter 1, God throw, just revealed a bunch of the blessings that He has for us. Yes. But now I have uh, chapter 2, and we're kind of going the different direction. Uh -oh. Now, as the adversary always gets in, you know, right. he, does. he gets in his, his blows. Mm -hmm. And uh, chapter 2 in my Bible, it's listed under destructive doctrines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Destructive doctrines. As we look at chapter 2, mm -hmm. uh, the verses, the question in the quarterly says, what powerful condemning words is Peter saying here? And that is in 2 Peter 2, 1 through 17. We don't have time to look oh, at all of those, well. but I want to touch on a few of those things. Mm -hmm. Peter warns us of destructive doctrines. Uh, notice okay. a few of them in verse 1, mm -hmm. first of all. He warns of false prophets and false teachers. Mm -hmm. Well, False prophets mm -hmm. and false teachers among you. You know, teachers of uh, spiritual matters, as well as teachers in the public school system, have a great responsibility. That's right, yeah. Amen. A great responsibility because they are forming lives. Mm. The people in their class are there to learn mm -hmm. and to bring it into their, their, their way of life. And so he says that there are uh, spiritual teachers that are false teachers. Yes. They have a huge responsibility to preach truth. That's Amen. right. Even in our public schools. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we find in our public schools there are a number of wonderful Christian teachers mm -hmm. in our public schools who will compromise when it oh. comes to the origin of man. Well. Mm -hmm. And we think, I don't quite understand that. You know, the Word of God says that God created man in His image. That's right. And yet we have good Christian people some, not all, mm -hmm. in the Christian public, in public schools that will water down the truth there you go. to make it easier, yeah. okay. you know. <laughs> Each student is being formed in the image of God or in the image of the world. Yes. And you know, we can put parents into the category of teachers. That's right. Hey, Can't we? Yeah. That's right. Parents That's right. have much more influence than the teachers do right. because how many hours of the day, you know, are, are the kids at home with the parents mm -hmm. rather than uh -oh. in the school? Uh -oh. So teachers have, uh, uh, teachers, uh, not just teachers, influence the children, oh, but yeah. parents even more so because mm. children are impacted. You know, Solomon wrote in Proverbs 22, 6, mm -hmm. he says, train up a child in the way oh, right. that he should go. And when he is old, what? He will, not not depart. he will not depart from it. You know, we need to unpack that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 22, 6 uh, sometimes feels like a hammer and beats down the already brokenhearted people who have watched their children leave the church, oh, yeah. leave the faith. Mm -hmm. sure. And yet they're claiming the promise of Proverbs 22, 6. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, we've seen good, honest, faithful mm -hmm. parents bring up their 
children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And yet when the children became of age Mm -hmm. and even earlier, and it decided to go another path. And so we think, well, Mm. is that not true? I've struggled with the understanding of that passage myself. Mm. On the surface, it does seem that there is a promise they will not depart. Right. That's mm-hmm. what it says. Yes. On the other hand, there seems to be clear exceptions to the rules. We all know that, and maybe it's even happened in our own families, mm-hmm. that there seems to be an exception to the rule, and yes. that it means pretty much the opposite of what we've mm-hmm. taken it to mean. And let me explain that a little mm-hmm. bit. It is not necessarily a promise to good parents, but a warning to bad parents who would shirk their responsibilities. Well, now. Mm. Shirk their responsibilities to guide their children, especially teenage children, in the ways of the Lord. Mm -hmm. This verse is meant to be a warning about bad results of permissive parenting, a a failing to set boundaries and give guidance to adolescents. You know, their characters are being developed that will form the rest of their lives. And so we have to be so responsible and we have to teach our children to recognize the authority of the Word of God. Yes. yes. The authority of the Word of God. We must teach the children to respect the authority of the Word of God, to believe it, to embrace it, and to live it. Yes. I'm talking about eternal life and eternal death in these mm-hmm. matters. Sure. The responsibilities on every teacher, every parent, I would say. You have the influence over your students. You have the influence over your children, over your grandchildren even, Mm -hmm. regardless of their age. Mm. That's right. Mm. And as we go down to verse 3 of 2 Peter 2, Peter tells us that there are false teachers will exploit you with deceptive words. Mm. Well. Verses 4 through 8, God tells us of the doom of false teachers. Mm -hmm. And in verse 6, he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. And I want to look at that with me in your Bible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In verse 6 yeah. of Second Peter 2, it says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, mm-hmm. condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward mm-hmm. would live ungodly. Well, we have such a responsibility yes. to teach right. And you know, even though sin is in the world so strongly, there is a limit to God's patience. That's right. True. That's right. And I, I have a quote here from Patriarchs and Prophets, mm-hmm. page 162, and it is entitled, Limits to Sinning. The mm-hmm. flames that consume the cities of plain shed their warning light down even to our time. Yes. We are taught the fearful and solemn lesson that while God's mercy bears long with the transgressor, there is a limit beyond which men may not go in sin. Mm. When that limit is reached, yes. then the offers of mercy are withdrawn right. and the ministration of judgment begins. Mm. It's heavy. So, wow, well, that is heavy. Yeah. That's right. There is a limit to God's mercy. That's right. Let's continue now in verse 9 of, uh, of that same chapter, mm-hmm. chapter 2. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Praise Thank God. you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And to reserve the unjust un- uh, under punishment for the day of judgment. Mm. Yes. And then he continues, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. Well. They are presumptuous, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Oh and this was a really eye opener. Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring no. a reviling right. accusation against them before the Lord. Mm-hmm. That's fairly strong itself. Yes. If you notice that sharp rebuke that Peter talks about those who despise authority in verse 10. Mm-hmm. He, writes about, uh, he writes about it then as if it were us now. It's like he's writing today's oh, news. Sure. Even yeah. back then it was the same. There are those who despise authority that dates all the way back to heaven itself. Mm. I think Brother Ryan mentioned something about this. The Bible tells us that there was an angel by the name of Lucifer and he despised the authority of God. Yes, yes. That's right. He despised the authority of God. And as a result, he was cast out of heaven. You can read about that in Ezekiel 28 mm-hmm. and Revelation 12. 
And then as we bring that down to our church situa situations now, we as a church body must work in the assumption of certain levels of authority even in the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, look at Hebrews chapter 13 just for a second, mm -hmm. and I want you to see where I'm coming from on this. Right. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 says, Remember those who rule over you, mm -hmm. who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Mm -hmm. Again, he mentions those in 17, verse 17, Obey those who rule over you mm -hmm. and be submissive, and that they watch out for your souls as yeah. those mm -hmm. who must give an account. Yeah. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Uh -huh. And then again in verse 24, greet all of those who rule over you and all of the saints. Mm -mm -mm. So we find that no man is an island unto himself. That's right. <laughs> you know, each one of us in the structure of our present environment, we all have someone that is over us. That's right. And we have to learn the authority that they have and find our place in that and be mm -hmm. submissive to that. Yeah. We are called to submit and obey mm -hmm. those in authority. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To the degree that one is being faithful to the Lord Himself. That's mm -hmm. right. And you think about that. Mm -hmm. There are those who resist authority in every group, in every church. There is also those that are resisting in every group. That's right. Yes. Everywhere. Yeah, and we find that we have to give to authority. We are not the mm -hmm. final word, that's any right. one of us. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you so much, Praise Pastor Ronnie, Shelley, yeah. Pastor Kenny, Pastor Ryan. What an amazing launch, you could say, to fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. We just have a few moments left and give that's you right. each a moment to share about your day or about the lesson. That's right. Hey, it's very simple from my perspective. Be educated by Jesus. Leave that devil alone. Very simple. <laughs> very simple. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12, quickly. Now all things happen unto us for what? They're examples, yeah. and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the earth are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. Ooh, mm. Well, Mercy. mine would be simply this, yeah. that God is a God of restoration mm. and he intends to restore the image of Jesus in us. We open the Bible well. in Genesis, Eden lost, Revelation, Eden restored. Amen. Uh, my closing summation would be without proper authority in place, the world would be in havoc, wouldn't it? Well, yes. wouldn't it though? Oh, wouldn't yeah. it be a mess? That's right. But we are thankful that God is still on His throne of authority. Amen. Amen. And He's right. still in charge. That's, That's right. right. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 What an incredible yeah. study. I'm looking forward to the rest of the lessons here <laughs> as we study together. Mm -hmm. I want to leave you with this closing scripture. Mm -hmm. This is 2 Timothy. This is Paul's, you could say, at the end of his life. He's in prison writing to his son in the faith. Parting words. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. New King James says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Now, King James says what, Pastor Kenny? Study. Study, Study to, show, yes. to show thyself approved unto God. That's right. A workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly yeah. dividing the word of truth. That is what the goal of all education is, that we need mm -hmm. to study to know the character of God, That's right. know who God is, mm -hmm. and then have that character be restored in us, as Shelley brought out so beautifully, mm -hmm. that reconciliation or restoration back to the Father. Amen. That is the goal when Jesus came and died on the cross, and that is his goal for each one of us Amen. to be restored right. into the image of the Father. Mm -hmm. Join us next week. We're going to be picking up with lesson number two, The Family.
stand as we sing our call to worship song. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, God is good, everybody. All the time. Amen. pandemic to to stop us stop the movement of the church would you agree with me amen yes yeah, so we, we have a responsibility not to to government nor to anybody else but we have a responsibility to God to to make sure that we spread the word around and I know some of us have been studying with folks um, some of us want to study with folks but for some reason we cannot find the time um, for others, you know, they want to study, but, you know, we need a little bit more training. Um, what I'm, I'm proposing to you now is um, I have a list outside there. Um, I would like you to at least write the names of individual. Of course, you have to talk to them, too. Are we together? Amen. Come on, talk to me. You have to ask them a question. Would you like to know more of what is happening in our society? Do you want to want to study the Bible? Um, we have, in our church, we have an opportunity for folks to know more about the Bible. Um, we have a Bible worker. Um, he can help you. So um, if they say yes, or even if they, they requested prayer, I would like you to just tell them um, our Bible worker will give you a call. So I would like you to write the names of those who you know and who you talk will talk to that will want a Bible study or a prayer. You know, write the name and the telephone number, of course, and the email, but I prefer telephone number because if you're going to contact them, it's easier to contact them. Let me tell you something before I say it. Most people that I have been uh, in uh, that I have associated with, um, I was introduced to them. Um, I was introduced to them. Um, Sister Sharon told me, you know, she, she, she took me around. She says, you know, this is our Bible worker. Uh, are you interested in studying? And, and she contacted she contacted them. And so in, in that way, I was able to study with them, right? Because I was in, introduced to them. Many people will not, you know, readily say to me, oh, yeah. But they will say to you, yes. And so that's what the Lord wants. He wants you to introduce them to me so that I can, we can, not I, because we are interdependent. We depend on each other. Amen? Amen. Yeah, we need each other. So, the Lord is counting on you. Please, before you leave here, 
Uh, think about them, but you talk to them. And write the name, the numbers, or the email, um, the email so that we can reach out to them. At least I'm looking for some names. Can I count on you? Amen. Oh, that, that, that wasn't the good of it. Can the Lord count on you? Yes. Amen. All right. So the, the, the list is out there. So if you can't do it today, you just get that information and call it in. Call the pastor, call the, the elders, call me, you know, so that we can know, hey, we have some folks, they are interested, and we would like you to reach out to them. God bless you as we continue to cooperate with the Spirit of God. this morning is hymn number 159, The Old Rugged Cross. I love that old cross with 
the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged be above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange the something for a Sabbath, everyone. Good Happy Sabbath. For those that are able, I ask that you'll kneel with me, and those that cannot, just bow your heads and your hearts to God as we reach to Him. Heavenly Father, Father, that you bless those efforts, that you may bring the people that need to hear your word. I know that not just us, but many people in the world are asking what is happening and what comes next. But the wonderful thing is that we find answers in your word. My Father, I ask that these words which will be shared during the coming weeks, that the people who really need to hear it may be able to attend, that they may be reached by you, Lord. In any way that we can help and Tell others about this wonderful news that you have to share with everyone who is in distress, who is fearful, and is doubtful of what's coming. You have answers. Lord, I ask that your blessing may be upon this series, and that it be for the saving of many souls. I ask, Father, today that whoever that 
as the speaker comes up, that the words that she's going to share may encourage every, every single one of us, that we all may be ready, Lord, to receive it. Give us your Holy Spirit, a double portion, so we may be able to grasp the message that each of us has to receive on this day. We thank you and praise you for yet to this day you've provided everything to everyone, and that we know that going forward, Lord, you have our future in your hands. And we trust fully in your word, we trust fully in you, that you will see us through to your second coming. Thank you for your grace, for all of your providence and benefits that come for being attached to you, Lord. Help us to be closer to you as the day progresses. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange. Sorry, I forgot I was reading scripture also. I got it up there. Reading from Jonah, first chapter, first two verses. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Yes? There we go. Not too loud, it's me. Look, there's more of you than last time I was here. So I know we have some visitors today, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Great to see you. And uh, lots going on, lots of good things happening here. And I know we've got some folks at home, so good to see all of you. So is that our new projector mounted from the ceiling in the back? Nice, look how fancy. Terrific. All right. Let's bow our heads one more time. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word, and we pray now that the same spirit that powerfully inspired it would come and dwell among us. You have promised that where two or more are gathered, there you are, in the middle. And so that's what we need. And so we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a hard pill to swallow. Are you ready? All right, so how many of you think you know this story? Come on, come on, be confident. You've read the story, right? All right, so um, we're just going to make sure that there's a few things that we lay down as a foundation before we go back there. It's been a number of years since I've been through Jonah, and I just felt impressed recently how contemporary it is. And so you would think that maybe this was an odd story to deem as contemporary considering the current times, but um, let's see if we can't all agree on that before we're finished. So I want you to think of the book of Jonah like a sandwich. Okay, big sandwich. And those of us who like to eat Subway sandwiches this week learned that their bread isn't really bread, so that's really sad. So too much sugar in their bread for it to be really bread, so let's be careful if we love to eat at Subway. But let's think of a nice big Subway sandwich, all right? And the top piece of bread is our God's um, saving mercy for Jonah, right? The bottom piece of bread is our God's saving mercy for Nineveh, for the Assyrians. And the Bible is often structured this way. So now we're going to move into the middle of the sandwich. The next layer, you know, like when I was a kid, you know, I have to confess, I loved a bologna sandwich. I loved a bologna sandwich on Wonder Bread and then I, yellow mustard. And I used to squish the bread around the bologna. So head into the next layer of the sandwich and we have Jonah's unexplained disobedience. And then you go up from the bottom again, 
and you have Jonah's disobedience explained. And then you start to get to the middle, and you have Yahweh saves the sailors, and then you come up from the bottom, and Yahweh saves Nineveh, but in the middle, you see, that's the most important part. It's called the chiastic structure. In the middle is the most important part. And you thought I already mentioned the most important part. But in the middle is that Yahweh, our good God, saves Jonah. So we're going to unpack that a little bit. And we're not going to do the whole story today. So I, I failed as I've written this series. Um, we're going to be together four times this month. So I hope you don't get sick of looking at me. Um, it was a help to the pastor if he had a little shoulder to shoulder for his preaching schedule. So I'm going to be here for the next four Sabbaths. So we are going to cover Jonah in three parts, and then we've got a baptism in there, amen and amen. So I promise on that day we'll deviate slightly, and we'll have a short homily. I'll figure out how to do that. And, um, and that's what we're going to be doing over the month. All right, so everybody ready? ready. Here we go. All right, so Jonah and the what? Okay, so first of all, you got to kick that right out, because that's not what the scripture says necessarily. What I want you to do, that if you're going to get the most out of this story, is to remember that even though it's been a sweet children's tale, and even though we've used it for wallpaper in our baby nurseries, that is not what this is. This is not a sweet, gentle children's story. There's some very important things going on. So we've got to get it out of the little hardback kids book, and we've got to see it as the dynamic story of God jumping off the pages of scripture that it is. Okay? That's the first thing we can agree on. Secondarily, if I were to say to you, here's the only picture you get, and we're playing some kind of version of charades, what's the answer to the question if you're looking at this picture? It's a big fish. It's a fish story, right? And when you tell a fish story... What happens every time you tell the story? The fish gets bigger. All right, so what's very important about this story also is that it ain't about the fish. Right? There's a fish in it. There's other Bible stories with fish in them. There ain't, it ain't about the fish. Although we would just like to see the proportions you know, because this guy right here, if you can look to the left of the bird, that's his bum you're looking at. And his fins that he nearly got swallowed himself. You can see that there's creatures out in nature that are large enough to get the deed done. But I want you to remember that this story, we've already established it, is about our God and his saving grace for one man and one nation. It ain't about the fish. Okay? Ready to start? Here we go. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. So that just tells us a little bit about who he is. And what we do know by the texts that follow is that he was in some kind of a relaxed, sitting, lying, comfortable position. All right? Because the Lord says in the next verse, what are the first two words? Get up. Get up. Ever been anywhere? Doing anything? in a season of your life, when the Lord comes along on a day that you just did not know was going to be a different kind of day, and he says, get up. So that's what happened to our man Jonah. Get up. Go to Nineveh, that, what kind of city, friends? Great city, and cry out in protest against it because their what? Their evil has come to my attention. Friends, does God miss anything? Is he ever duped by anything? ever surprised by anything? Is he a long-suffering, loving, good God? Absolutely. And it's really sad and a shame that very often in our culture, the Lord gets the blame for evil. The Lord is not to blame for evil. That is not his design, his doing. He is a patient, long-suffering God that puts up with the choices we make, is this popping against the shield terribly? I'm sorry. All right. I'll try not to pee so hard. All right. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, then cry out in protest against it because their evil has come to my attention. 
Now, I want to tell you something about Jonah that 2 Kings lets you know, just so you get an idea of the man. Because when you think of a prophet, my friends, what normally comes to your mind? Economic status of a prophet. Poor. Does that come to your mind sometimes? Okay, he's sort of poor. How's he dressed? Kind of shabby. Okay? And it's okay if you don't think of a prophet this way, but sometimes we do. Okay, so poor, kind of shabby. You know, does he have a lot of friends? No, well, you know, he's kind of an unpopular fellow, etc. But I want you to know that that is not, and I repeat, not what was going on with Mr. Jonah. Okay, 2 Kings lets us know that Jeroboam II, he was the king, recovered the territories of Israel between Libo, Hamath, and the Dead Sea, just means from north to south, as the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised through who? Okay, so was this guy friends with the king? Did he have an excellent reputation as a man who preached good news and watched it come to pass? Did he have a good 401k? Did he have nice clothes? Did he, you know, live in the vicinity of the palace? Look at it. It's cushy. All right, I want you to understand that it's cushy. Now, what are the two words that the Lord used when he called him? He said, get up. Get up. Now, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian nation. And I want you to understand that it wasn't until modern times that Nineveh was ever dug out of the ground. And we'll get to that when we get to a later part of our um, story. Not today, another day. But for a long time, the Bible was the only place that said that Nineveh existed. So the scoffers were many. And we'll talk about what happened to them. But today, I just want to remind you of the Assyrians, these people that God is sending Jonah out to preach against for two. They were builders, amazing engineers. They were artists of great sculpture, and I'm going to show you some of it before we're done. They were scholars with an advanced literary tradition and an extensive and sophisticated, unfortunately, <laughs> bureaucracy. Okay? They weren't any backwoods, low-grade nobodies. They were a power, a force in the world. But here was the problem, friends. The Assyrian Empire was known for its what? Cruelty. No power, no power was more useless, more savage, more terrible. The kings of Assyria tormented, some scholars say, the miserable world. And I'm not going to read you what's written on the list. So just pick a couple so that you can see what it was that they were guilty of and how God had had enough. And I want you to see the principle that the scripture lays out over and over again, that wrath, that judgment rises until the cup is what? Full. Until the cup is is full. So, you see, God had never done this before. He'd never sent a prophet of Israel to a foreign nation. So I want you to sort of get a feeling for what that was like for our man Jonah, because we have a tendency to oversimplify what the man went through. So imagine if you were a young Jewish rabbi and the Lord had called you on the phone and said, hey, I have a job for you to do in Berlin. It would be like that. That's, the, that's what we're talking about in terms of the world domination, in terms of the fierceness of the empire, in terms of the feeling. How did Jonah feel about Assyria? Give me some words, friends. How did Jonah feel about Assyria? Hate's a good one. How about something stronger? Repulsed, thank you. That sort of gets into your veins a little bit. That's good. What else? Say it again. 
I think he's a little scared, but we're going to try to unpack some of his deeper motivations. I don't want you to think that he didn't find it intimidating. Of course he found it intimidating, but I don't think that what happened afterward was motivated primarily by fear. And that's why it's important for us to spend a little time with it so that we can check in on our own motives. How did Jonah feel about Assyria? Detest, repulsed, disgusted, and he was waiting for something, and we're going to see what he was waiting for. It was very contrary to what God was telling him to do. So here we are, Berlin, right? That would be highly intimidating. So this is an artist's picture of Nineveh. Once it was excavated, friends, it was the preeminent capital of the ancient Mesopotamian world. And you'll learn later in the story that to cross it on foot will take you three days to give you some idea of its size. So to give you also some idea of where Jonah's head was at, let's take a peek at Nahum. Because Nahum had some things to say, another book in your Bible, about Nineveh. And what Nahum said was that Nineveh, Nineveh was in for it. They were filling up the cup, piling it up, and they were headed for doom. Doom declared, doom described, doom deserved. And Jonah was way cool with that. Nahum talked about the limits of God's patience. The limits of God's patience. But that was not God's call to Jonah. And so it's interesting, isn't it? The passion, the ministry, the drive that each of us has in terms of our family, our workplace, our culture, our country. And what God is calling us to. You guys have a seminar coming up. And each of you will be given a calling for prayer, for further study on your own, to greet those folks that will eventually come through the door once your virtual meeting is over. And so you see it here in the scriptures. Jonah was banking on God being the God that Nahum was talking to. But sometimes, friends, we have to be present, willing, able to recognize the God who's talking to us. Are you with me? All right. Because the Bible says this in Psalm 33, from heaven the Lord looks down and sees how many? All mankind. From his dwelling place he watches how many? All who live on earth. He forms the hearts of how many? Who considers everything they do. I once heard a speaker say something that has stayed with me and helped me a great deal across my Christian journey. She said, if you understood the whole story of any particular person, then you would know why they do the things that they do. Right? And so God looked down, he knows their story, and what is his heart for them, for the Ninevites? He wants them to repent. And he's going to give them an opportunity before their cup is full to do what? To repent. And Jonah found that to be a very hard pill to swallow. A very hard pill to swallow. Something especially that is unpleasant or difficult unavoidable and must be expected accepted excuse me ever been there hard pill to swallow and the truth may be the hardest pill of all because friends before he could go to the Ninevites and preach repentance to the Ninevites guess what had to be true first he himself had to be ready he himself had to be prepared. He himself had to do the soul-searching, self-searching necessary so that the words that were coming out of his mouth were authentic. Yes? 
But he found that a very hard pill to swallow. So <laughs> he made a decision. And I do not believe that that decision was made primarily from fear. It's in there. But it's not primarily from fear. What is his largest no wrong answer to the question? Objection. Say it again. Prejudice. Is that what you said? Okay. These people, what category are we going to put them in? Because that's what we do when we're prejudicial. We put people in a category. What category are we going to put them in if we're Jonah? They're enemies. Thank you. There's one. They are evil. Okay, so that's a moral judgment. We can still say they're, enemy, we, they're evil without necessarily being prejudicial. Do you agree with me? You can make a moral judgment by God's good grace without being prejudicial in your heart. All right, so they are enemies. They are, what's the other labels that he's going to give them? Undeserving, thank you, there's one. How about just the big old Gentile label? They're Gentiles. They're pagans. Are you serious? So he made a decision. He got up and he did what? Who said ran? Ran's good. Fled implies that he, you know, he didn't take his time. You know, he didn't pack his 13 by 27 by 12 suitcase. He took off like a shot. He fled from the Lord to where? To Tarshish. And in one split second, which God was not surprised by, by the way, Jonah became the prodigal prophet. Okay? Jonah became the prodigal prophet. And I believe that that's an excellent label if we're going to give one to him because I think if you know the story of the prodigal son you know that there were Way and whose way? My way and God's way, and he is taking which street? My way. Frank Sinatra, be whatever, you know, like he's doing it his way. And he is going to do more than sit on the dock of the bay. Yes? God told him to get up put on his shoes, move across the land toward Nineveh, and he's like, no, thank you, and he grabbed his bathing suit, and he's heading for the sea. Now, I want you to notice something. What's the third word in our sentence? He went down. And this is a direction that we're going to watch Jonah go in. He went down to Joppa, secured passage on a ship bound for Tarshish, paid the fare and boarded, intending to go with the mariners, not the land walkers, because that's what he was supposed to be doing, with the mariners to Tarshish to do what? Come on, people, he's a prophet. Can he escape from the Lord? Does he know that? Somewhere in there he knows that, but come on, let's show the man a little, you know, mercy ourselves. Haven't you ever been there? When you knew something was true, when you knew that your conduct, your decision, your trajectory was so irrational. 
but he's motivated by a number of things which we are going to see. So we've decided in the beginning that we think he's a little afraid. We think he's a lot prejudiced against God's plan. So he is going to try to do something that is wildly weird. He is going to try to thwart God's plan at whatever cost comes to him. Now, I'm even going to say that there is a bit of wild and weird self-righteousness in that. Are you with me? You know, it's like, Lord, you cannot be serious. You want me to stay in this job? These people are unfair, unkind, ask ridiculous things, and you want me to stay in this job? Here's one that comes a little closer to home. Lord, you cannot be serious. You want me to stay in this marriage? Where I'm not getting my needs met? Where things are difficult every day? That's what you want me to do? You want me to stay here? These are the kinds of places, the real places, where my way and God's way come up against one another. And it can be challenging, friends. Don't you agree? It can be very challenging when our expectations are unmet in the very place that God is clearly, clearly leading. But God is good. How often? And all the time, my friends, God is good. And this was what Jonah was having trouble with. So watch. If you want to know, like, how far his confusion was willing to be taken, check it out. Now, the scholars don't all agree exactly about what route he was going to take in terms of where ancient Tarshish was, But some people, many people believe it was the Strait of Gibraltar, right between Morocco and the tip of Spain, top of Africa, bottom of Spain. And that is a long, long way to run. And some people believe that he actually went down the what would be eventually called the Darius Canals to the Gulf. And so even then, he's moving very far away through Egypt and descending in a southwardly manner. Some people believe that he only went halfway, about as far as Utica, across the ocean. But it doesn't really matter, friends, because he had turned his back against the call that had been given. His heart, more than anything, was facing in the wrong direction. His heart was facing in the wrong direction. And thus it begins, friends. How much fun is that? And I know that's a rhetorical question, but still. I mean, talk about stress. That is a lot of stress. If you think that there's stress to stay in your job or stay in your marriage or recommit yourself to parenting or recommit yourself to a deeper level of Christian journeying and experience, I don't know, but it can't possibly be as hard as having your heart facing in the wrong direction. You with me? You guys are a little sleepy today. So I encourage all of us, myself included, friends, this pandemic is exhausting. Don't you find it exhausting? It's exhausting. It's like I knew, you know, we're going to talk about this when we get to part three, which will be the last part of this message. So I sort of knew, you know, like I was a student of prophecy and I knew there was something coming down the pike, but I'm terribly convinced that this is only the pretest. And so it's like, my friends, we got to build up some muscle. Some muscle. Because if our heart is facing in the right direction, while we'll have a few hours and a few days feeling like this, it will not be able to consume us. And what happened to our man Jonah will not happen to us if our heart is facing in the right direction. Because you may be standing on the corner of God's way and my way. You know, the little street near your house. 
But the longer that you move on that narrow street called my way, and I shouldn't call it narrow because the Bible says his way is narrow, the more that you move on that street called my way, the broader the path comes, the more traffic there is moving you along at 62 miles an hour, and you're stuck, and there is no exit ramp in sight. So then there's this beautiful word right here. What's the first word? But. Lord's like, okay. God's not caught by surprise here, friends. Remember, the chiastic structure of this book right in the center of our sandwich is that Yahweh, the God of grace, is going to save who? Jonah. And if he gets a few other things accomplished along the way, then amen and amen, because he is a very efficient God. But the Lord threw a great, great wind onto the sea. Whichever sea Jonah found himself on, he threw a, a great wind onto it. And such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to what? Now, this is a serious storm, my friends. The word threw, that he threw the storm onto the sea. It's the same idea of taking a spear and chucking it. So God was purposeful in what he was doing, and this is the word that's used, it's pronounced tool. He threw a great storm on the sea. And so there is just a lot going on. I want you to get some idea of the sensory experience of this story. Again, I want you to take it forever out of that cardboard, heavy bound kids book, and I want you to let it into your soul. Because the word sin isn't anywhere written in this book. But there is so much going on for those of us living in 21st century America. You can feel it. It's palpable. So if you're on this ship, tell me what you're experiencing. It's... Goodness, you guys are sleepy today. You have to put up with me for the next three weeks, so come on! What are your experiences on this ship? All right, so you're scared. You're for sure scared. And you're also seasick. Okay, like, I don't know if you've got your little Dramamine bracelet on. That's pushing on your pressure point. But your stomach is, like, rolling. Okay, this is serious. All right, you're also probably... Say it again. What? There is a lot going on. I want you to feel the pulse of what's happening. And I want you to remember that forever, forever, brothers and sisters, we have got to put experiences like this in a different category than we customarily do. When things are really rocking and rolling in our lives, we are very tempted to believe that God's attitude towards us is what? Say it again. Over? He doesn't want to be bothered with me anymore. He has just given me over to my own devices. Shape up, kid, and I'll meet you on the other side. Right? Am I the only person who thinks these crazy thoughts? Don't leave me out here hanging. But that's not what this is. And so forever, friends, let's put these kinds of experiences into a different category. Let's call it disruptive what? Because God's purpose here is to save. That's his purpose, to save. Now, is Jonah on this boat by himself? No, not on the boat by himself. All right, so the sailors were what, my friend? Afraid. Now, so what does that tell you about this storm? This was serious. This was different. And you'll see in their uh, vocabulary, the words that they use, that they knew it was different. These are seasoned sailors who've been on the ocean, on whatever sea we're on, and this was different. Each cried out to his own God, and they threw the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load. Now, that's a whole other sermon all by itself. 
Because I could just break you out right now into small groups and send you off somewhere and say, okay, all I want you to talk about is the cargo in your life that you have to pitch over the side to do what? To lighten your load. And friends, I encourage you to spend some time right here with this text. I encourage you to mark it, underline it, underline it, make it something you're going to do this week. Because if this pandemic is the pretest, then lightening the load is something we must do while we have time to do it. Are you with me? So, you know, there's some practical things. How much debt do we have? How much junk do we have? How many things are left undone, unsaid? How much out of focus is our focus? So, whole sermon all by itself. But what I want you to notice in our particular story is if these sailors in the middle of this crisis are throwing their cargo overboard, that is akin to what? I don't mean something you're going to do. I mean genuinely in the moment with them. What are they throwing into the sea? Their livelihood, their profits, their money. They're throwing it right into the ocean because they believe that if they don't, it's going to cost them what? Their lives. This is a very serious season of disruptive grace. So they do it. They take the cargo, they take everything they're getting paid to do, and they throw it overboard, belonging to their clients, belonging to themselves. What's that word again? But. But our man Jonah, what's his trajectory? Down. Our man Jonah had gone down to the lowest part of the vessel. Okay, so he's in the ship. Is he getting wet? Nope, not getting wet. He's down into the lowest part of the vessel. And then once he got to the lowest part of the ship, he wasn't low enough, my friends. What does he do? He lays down and he falls into a deep sleep. All right, so two things I want you to notice here. He is checking out. Jonah knows the consequences of trying to escape from God. Is he going to get what he's hoping for? Maybe not. But he's willing to completely detach himself from life, friends, and king to accomplish it. And he knows that it may cost him his life. While they're up fighting this storm with this ship that's very likely going to sink, he's just going to lay down and go to sleep. And what is the possible assumption here? That he's not going to wake up. And I believe that he is willing, in his blindness, in his steel rod pride, in his total disillusionment at what God had asked him to do, he's willing to give it over. Powerful, isn't it? Now, does this remind you of another story? Any other stories that come to mind? But a man sleeping in a boat while there's a storm. The Lord. And we won't get to it today, but we will get to it eventually. That of all the premier and obedient and excellent examples of prophets in the scriptures, this is the one that Jesus connects himself to. Right? And so when we do part two and three, we'll talk about that. But I want you to remember, and I want you to tell me the difference in their sleep. First of all, you and I, we've already covered this story in a previous sermon. And remember that when we did, the most important question that I asked God before I would even begin to do my research was, look, I need to know something. Were you really sleeping? Was Jesus really sleeping? In this boat? Come on, of course he was really sleeping. The Lord don't lie. 
He'd been working hard. He was exhausted. And he laid down in the lower part of the ship and he went to sleep. What's the difference between their sleep, between Jesus' sleep and Jonah's sleep? Just think out loud. It's okay. No wrong answer to the question. It was a peaceful sleep. He was tired. He'd been ministering all day. He was exhausted, but he laid down in a way so as to cradle himself into a place of safety and peace. Did Jonah do that? No, nothing like. And so what I want to offer to you, which I think is highly appropriate, even though you're going to be doing these meetings virtually, God is going to open up huge doors if you're willing to do something that Jesus would not, excuse me, that Jonah was not willing to do. All right, all of us, friends, no matter who we are, we have a worldview. What is our worldview shaped by? Our environment, okay? That's one of the things that our worldview is shaped by. It's shaped by our environment. It can be shaped by the circumstances of our birth. I'll just tell you mine. My mother turned 18 on June 10, and I was born eight weeks premature with the same disease that killed the Kennedy's last child on August 25. You think that shaped my worldview? Of course it did. So worldview can be shaped right right from early, early experiences. I was half of a set of twins for 12 weeks. There was a heart beating next to mine as long as it beat, and then it stopped beating. You think that shaped my worldview? It did. I'm here to tell you. Okay, so circumstances of our birth, our environment, the family we came into. My father left before I could walk shaped my worldview. My mother married four times over the course of my life, shaped my worldview. I was not raised in a Christian home, shaped my worldview. So all of us have a worldview. Now, whether you're, if you're raised in a Christian home, then hopefully your parents, and if you become a Christian like I did at 17, then now you start to develop a what? A biblical worldview. So now you start to look at the Bible through the lens of the scriptures, through the lens of salvation history, and you're like, okay, I got this, I got this. And friends, uh, come on, let's tell the truth. Did we think we had it, and then the pandemic hit, and then it was like, do we got it? Did you think this was going to happen? So then we try harder. We're like, okay, I need some God glasses. Can I have some God glasses, please? Because if I just had some God glasses, then maybe I could just see it a little clearer. And I'm not saying that this is a bad pursuit. This is a great pursuit. But friends, what we have to come to, which Jonah could not come to, which Jesus lived every day with the full assurance and knowledge of, is that God sees what? What we can't. So why fight it? Why let your pride get in the way of something that's impossible? Our worldview has got to change. Even those of us that have been steeped in, have been blessed by the word, the scriptures, Christian people, a great church, we have always got to be open to the kind of current and present change that God wants to bring to our lives. Do you agree? How can we win everyone, win anyone if we refuse to grow? So the shipmaster came to him. Who's him? Sleeping Jonah. And he said, what do you mean, sleeper? Hey, stupid, wake up. Arise, call on your God. Maybe your God will notice us so that we won't perish. They understood that there was something supernatural at work. And they're trying to get him to pray. They're shaking him by the shoulders and slapping him upside the head. But I'm here to tell you, friends, that there's more going on than Jonah just being afraid. Because earlier in, um, he is serving, Jonah is serving Jeroboam II. 
Jeroboam the first, there was a prophet in his kingdom, and the Lord had sent him to deliver a scorching judgment message to the apostate king, and he told him that when he walked home, he only had one job, and that job was a fast, and the prophet disobeyed him, and when the prophet disobeyed him, guess what happened? You haven't read this story lately, have you? That's right! There was just the big old king of the jungle came along and took care of that. Jonah knew this. He understands what his fate is going to be. So each man said to his shipmate, come, let us cast lots so that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell to Jonah. Apparently the man would not come up out of the hold. He would not get involved in the disruptive grace that was going on. He knew what had happened. He wouldn't help these Gentiles. Isn't that interesting? I told you what your job is, my friend. Your job is to preach to the Gentiles. So they cast the lot, and the lot fell to Jonah. So finally, they just wouldn't let him escape the conversation anymore. And they're like, you got to fess up, my friend, because we know that it's you. So they said to him, verse 8, tell us upon whose account this evil has come. What is your occupation? Look at the questions they ask him. And where do you come from? And what is your country? And of what people are you? Friends, I am telling you that he is dressed incognito. Because in the ancient world, they could tell who you were, oftentimes, by the way you were dressed. So they ask him about his vocation. They ask him about his country. They ask him about his race, and they ask him about his religion. Friends, could this be any more contemporary? Now watch what his first answer was. I am a what? I'm a Hebrew. He didn't say I'm a prophet. He said I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, and then he just sort of gives in. Who what? Made the sea and the land. And for a second, friend, he did what you and I must do when disruptive grace comes to our lives, if we're going to survive it in the way that God wants us to, he remembered to whom he belonged. Because remember, there are characters in the scriptures who had great confidence in everything that they thought they knew. Here's Peter. What did he have great confidence in, friends? Lord, I will never. What did he say? I will never deny you. I will never betray you. I will never be disloyal to you. I will defend you with my life. And you know how that turned out. So they tell, he tells them the truth. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and he said to him, What is this that you have done to us? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of Yahweh because he told them all God had asked him to do was to stand on the corner of the love of God and the love of people, and he refused to do it. And friends, between now and November 3, you must do the very same thing. Do you hear me? Listen. Engage. Stay calm. Build bridges. You don't have to agree to build bridges. So they said to him, what should we do to you? <laughs> it's just a little funny. Just a little. What should we do to you to calm this sea that's against us? For the sea was getting what, friends? The, 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 what do you mean worse and worse? It was already threatening to do what? Break up the ship. And by the hour, it's getting worse. And he said to them, what did he say? Now, I'm here to tell you, friends, I don't want you to be as impressed as you might be. Because this was the plan, right? 
I'm going to move with my iron will against all that God has called me to because I just don't believe in the vision that God has with regard to his saving grace. And so if you're going to throw me in the ocean, this is what I wanted anyway because I give up. Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. Friends, what was the trajectory of Jonah's thought process? Down. So here it is. He was in the belly of the ship, and now he's very willing to go even lower. Do not let the enemy take you here. You reach up your hand. You get on your phone. You call somebody. You don't have to feel it to do it. You just have enough information to know that when you are this low, that you need to reach. He could not get his compass to point true north. He couldn't do it. He, had ex he expected to die, and he was fully reconciled to the idea. And here's something that Susan B. Anthony said, which was a little humorous and a little poignant. I distrust those people who, who know so well what God wants because to do, wants them to do, because I notice it always coincides with what? Their own desires. Now, you and I look at it and we're like, come on, you can't be serious. But if we were honest... We would say that this happens between us and God all the time. You want what? You want it when? You want me to do what? Why did Judas betray Jesus? There's a complicated set of motives. Jesus rebuked him when Mary anointed his feet. He said, you leave her alone. Mr. Greedy, I pay myself out of the treasury bag. And so he had an idea that he thought was perfectly in line with his own desires that was going to move God in a better direction than God was moving. Because Jesus kept talking about going somewhere. Where did he say he was going? Jesus kept talking about going to the cross. And Judas was like, uh-uh. That is not in my playbook. In Judas's playbook, where was Jesus going? He wanted him to lead the nation. So he could exert himself into the situation. He was sure that Jesus would never allow himself to be harmed by the authorities. He made a little money on the side and bingo, bango, everything's good. This is what we can do as human beings. Mixing our motives to the place of doing things that are wildly, wildly irrational. So the crewmen didn't consent. They were like, no, 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 no. I am not throwing you in the ocean. So what did they do? They rowed hard to bring the ship toward dry land, but what? They were unsuccessful because the sea was growing again. What is the description? More and more stormy. So friends, here's something so important, so telling about where Jonah's heart and mind were. Under this beautiful sky, any given night, who stands under the sky? Who stands under the sky? We do. All of us. And we look up and we can see this stunning, amazing celestial heavens. The Bible talks about it over and over again, how he reveals himself through nature. The Bible talks as well in Isaiah about the farmer who grows his crops. It talks about planting and sowing and harvesting. And it says, who gives that power, that gift, that ability? Who gives it? God gives it. He talks when he built the temple in Exodus chapter 31. The He's chosen people to make things. Now listen, it says, I have filled them with my spirit, given them wisdom, and made them skilled craftsmen who can create objects of art, gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Where did that come from? 
comes from God, the scientists who are working to help figure out how in the world to blunt the deadliness of this virus. Where does the skill come from? It comes from God. It's called common grace. The rain falls on who? All of us, the just and the unjust. And so God wanted Jonah to get it, and he wants us to get it. We are all in the boat together. We are not Democrats. We are not Republicans. We are not even Americans, if we say it right. We belong to Christ first. And our marching orders come from him first. We don't have to agree. But we do have to recognize that we are responsible to the common grace, the common good that is laid out in the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible says, let your light shine before others that they may see who you are and give glory to who? And in this ship, friends, who's acting for the common good? The Gentiles. So finally, they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord. Now they're talking to God. Nice. What was Jonah's job? So they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, don't let us die on account of this man. Don't hold us guilty of shedding innocent blood. After all, you, Lord, have done just what you pleased. And they took Jonah and they pitched him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. It's the same word for when the Lord pitched the storm on the sea. They pitched him overboard into this wild, raging sea and bang. Wow. Sounds a lot like this story, remember? A lot like it. And when that calmness came over the sea, that immediate calmness, these men did what? Now watch. They not only feared the Lord, watch what happens. They feared him exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and they made, they worshiped him, friends. What was it that God wanted Jonah to do? Preach and teach to those Gentiles. Now, our man Jonah, where's he headed? Down. You know, he's not like practicing all of those things he learned in swimming class, you know, like he's headed down. Now, the Lord had had enough of this guy and said, you are left to your own devices. Nope. That's not what disruptive grace does, right? The Lord had appointed a huge fish to swallow Jonah. So friends, when we are in the middle of a season of disruptive grace, when we have reaped because of what we have sown, are we alone? No. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So remember, don't be so quick to turn your heart in the wrong direction. But be quick to pitch your cargo overboard to lighten your load. Don't allow yourself to move from downward trajectory to downward trajectory. And when it's happening, it's hard to stop because you get bluer than blue before you figure out that that's where you are. But as soon as the spirit comes and gives you that inkling, you pick up the phone and you say, hey, corn maze, tomorrow. You know, I've never done one of those. Yeah. So here he is heading down, but God is not finished. Not finished. Can you imagine? Again, there's just a little humor that runs through this story, this beautiful story. Could you imagine like this 
bitch. <laughs> Trying to like, you know, just herd him into a place where he's got him just where he wants him so that he can do the thing that Jonah can't imagine is about to happen. And that's what we're going to talk about next time we're together. So until then, we're going to sing a little. You up for that? All right. <laughs> Jesus, I surrender all to Him. I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. Father in heaven, we thank you. Surrender isn't something we can conjure up or choose for ourselves most of the time. Surrender is a gift. Humility is a gift. Repentance is a gift. Before Jonah could offer it to any city, any man, any woman, any child, he had to experience it for himself. And it can be challenging after many years of following you in a certain trajectory, in a certain way, and having certain expectations. When change comes, sometimes we're so 
upended. And so I pray that we would join forces with our friend from the sea. That we would finally find ourselves with nothing. Having thrown it all overboard, having found the courage to turn our hearts back around in the right direction, that we would interpret the difficult times around us as disruptive grace. That you have come to seek and save the lost. And in many, many moments, Lord, that lost one, it's us. It's me. And if we're going to make a difference in the times that are coming, then we have got to be standing on the corner of God's way. And we have got to be moving down the broad path that says, I am here to love people. And sure, there are times coming when we will have to stand, when our civil disobedience will mean something to the cause of the gospel. But your calling until then is that we should keep our minds and our hearts and the doors of entry open. So teach us how, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
sorry, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. I just have a few announcements I'd like to share with the church family. But before I do that, I'd like to say on behalf of our church family, thank you to Janine for a wonderful sermon. Amen. We're truly blessed, and we thank you. And we look forward to next week when you continue with part two. Amen. So everybody was blessed today. Amen. 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 We put the hands there. Um, and for those of you who came in a little late because um, you didn't get the official welcome, I just want to welcome you. I came across a couple of families who came in late, so thank you for coming. Some of you for the first time, so we look forward to seeing you again. Now, um, the two announcements I want to share with our members are these. One, last week we had a wonderful lunch outside, a family lunch. We had individuals, whoever wanted to come and bring a track lunch. And we had a nice lunch outside, even among the raindrops, right? Mm -hmm. Amen. And it was a good mm -hmm. time. So we want to allow you, we want to accommodate going forward any family members who would like to do that, as long as the weather permits. You know, it's getting cold now, so mm -hmm. we may not be able to do that for too much longer. But if you so desire and would like to do that, just let us know so we can set up a table for you outside. Okay, so we want to make sure that we can accommodate those. I know not every one is going to stay every week to do it, but if any one family member who would want to do that, please let us know so we can accommodate you. We can get the, the, uh, the tables clean and all that. We can set them up clean for you to do that. So that's one. Um, the second um, announcement I'd like the family members to really, do you enjoy coming here to worship? Amen. Amen. Okay, it's much different. We want to continue this. Amen. And for the last three plus months, we've been worshiping here and thank God we haven't had an incident of transmission of disease. Amen. Amen. If you and I want to continue that, we need you to please continue to wear your mask once you get inside the facility. Social distancing, social distancing is important. We want you to continue to do that. It might be a little uncomfortable for a little bit, but please, for the safety of all of us, and you hear what's happening now, it's reaching to the highest levels, please practice that as long as you walk through those doors, 